Hey there YouTube, Wrestling Optimus here, back with another action figure review. It's the start of another wrestling week, which means it's time for Monday Night Raw on USA. As always, if you're new here, make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel for plenty more pro wrestling and action figure content. For now, we're headed into the Thunderdome. So for a review and some fantasy booking, let's take it over to the action figures. The opening WWE graphic is distorted and we immediately cut to RETRIBUTION attacking Raw. Five people storm the ring and take off their hoods, exposing various degrees of masks and face paint. Still, Mia Yim and Mercedes Martinez are instantly recognizable. Mia confirms that her brothers and sisters now have WWE contracts, but they're not motivated by money and they're done reaching for that imaginary brass ring. Was that a jab at Miro? Dominic Dijakovic has a newly shaved head and a Bane mask? Ugh. He says they're here to destroy WWE and take out the superstars who are only here to collect a payday like a bunch of whores. Well, that escalated quickly. So let me get this straight. Having a WWE contract allows you to do whatever you want whenever you want. How is that any different than what Retribution has been doing this whole time? These are the guys that used Molotov cocktails and chainsaws. And why can't other superstars do what they want? Also, if their goal is to destroy WWE, why would they be hired by WWE? Oh, and since when did we shame people for trying to make a living? None of this makes any sense. Their outfits look ridiculous, and their masks even interfered with Mia Yim's ability to cut her promo because she kept having to fix it. This entire thing was stupid. Out comes the Hurt Business. They slowly take off their suit jackets and head to the ring for some work but the invaders bail. MVP says they don't seem so tough without their weapons. Bobby Lashley says the Hurt Business doesn't need to hide behind masks. With that, roughly 10 more people surround the ring and quickly overwhelm the Hurt Business. Most brawl to the outside while Bobby Lashley is double powerbombed by Dijakovic and former announcer Dio Madden. By the way, Jerry the King Lawler is on commentary tonight, replacing Samoa Joe. Surprisingly, up next we're getting a triple threat tag team match to determine who will face the Street Profits at Clash of Champions. That's weird because I didn't even know Raw had three tag teams. The champs come out to their usual shower of solo cups which Angelo Dawkins decides to slide through on his way down the entrance ramp. They join commentary for the match. The first team out is Andrade and Angel Garza who are without Zelina Vega and standing about 10 feet apart. They're clearly still fighting with each other and I thought they broke up last week. Another team that's not exactly on the same page is Seth Rollins and Murphy after Rollins beat up his disciple following his loss last week. Rollins can be heard reassuring Murphy that everything is fine between them. Again, I thought these guys broke up last week. Finally, we get a brand new tag team that I actually fantasy booked the other week, Umberto Carrillo and Dominic Mysterio. I think these two will be perfect together. Unlike a normal triple threat tag team match, there's a member of all three teams in the ring simultaneously. On commentary, Dawkins says they already beat the other two teams, so they're rooting for Dominic and Umberto. Me too, fam. Speaking of those two, they do amazing stereo dives to take out Murphy and Andrade. Jerry Lawler inexplicably says, I think Andrade just lost the hearing in his left eye. <laughs> what? Then, out of nowhere, Seth abandons the match right as Murphy goes for the tag. As he walks out, he says to commentary that he doesn't have time for this and has a lot on his mind. Foreshadowing! Murphy looks bewildered. Angel Garza takes advantage, hitting the wing clipper and getting the win. Yet again, he and Andrade will be taking on the Street Profits at Clash of Champions. Ugh. What a complete waste of an opportunity to see an exciting new tag team absolutely go off on pay-per-view. As I fantasy booked the other week, Dominic Mysterio and Umberto Carrillo make a great tag team, and they proved me right in this match. I think they'd really connect with fans, especially kids who already love Rey and his high-flying lucha style. This is a no-brainer, which means, of course, WWE will totally ruin it. Shane McMahon is talking to the Raw Underground Bouncer much earlier than usual because he's so excited about the monster battle tonight. In fact, he's going to promote it on the KO show. A quick update on the rules of the Underground Door. Although someone else must still let you in, 
You can apparently leave under your own power, as Shane appeared without assistance at the start of this segment. Retribution is back with another promo. They say the Hurt Business is part of the problem. While others have to wait around for opportunities, the Hurt Business steals them in order to line their pockets with WWE's money. They're just doing this for a paycheck. However, their payment will come in the form of a match later. I guess we'll have to wait and see how the three males of Retribution handle the four members of Hurt Business. It's time for this week's episode of The KO Show. Owen says although he was attacked by Captain Hot Topic on the last episode, he took care of that problem when he beat Alistair last week. Tonight, his guest is someone he never thought he'd have on, Shane McMahon. They make allusions to their history together and how KO got Shane fired and somehow he's back. Anyway, that's all water under the bridge. Tonight, Shane is here to do what McMahons do best, promote a fight. Shane sounds completely winded as he hypes up Raw Underground. Since Dabakato is new, Shane decides to bring him out and formally introduce him to the WWE Universe. Owen says he actually anticipated this. He remembers what happened to him two weeks ago at the hands of Dabakato, and make no mistake, a receipt is coming. For tonight though, he'll let Dabakato focus on Strowman. But first, he bitch slaps the 7 foot monster to give him something to chew on, then introduces his surprise second guest. Out roars Braun Strowman. The monsters go straight for each other, but Shane steps in saying this only happens on Raw Underground, not the KO show. Suddenly, Kevin Owens is attacked from behind by Aleister Black, who drives him into the ring post three times while shouting, REMEMBER ME! Charlie Caruso interviews Drew McIntyre backstage and asks if he's concerned about competing with his fractured jaw again. He says yes. She asks about his fractured friendship with Keith Lee. He says last week was just business, and tonight will be no different. After all, if you're not trying to become champion, what are you doing here? Someday, they'll even laugh about this over drinks. After a commercial break, we see Retribution beating up Umberto Carrillo and Titus O'Neil in the back. Dominic Dijakovic says that from now on, they are the judge, jury, and executioner of WWE. Due to interference, we get a rematch of Drew McIntyre vs. Keith Lee for a title shot at Clash of Champions. McIntyre sells his jaw injury throughout. In a decent TV match, Drew manages to counter Lee's spear bomb twice and gets off a Claymore kick. But when he stands up from it, Randy Orton appears from out of nowhere and hits him with a steel chair. Orton drives the chair into McIntyre's jaw, then turns his attention to Keith Lee, delivering a punt to the Limitless One. He smiles sadistically into the camera. Randy cuts a promo in the ring, saying shame on the WWE Universe for doubting that he'd make Clash of Champions. Um, actually, I think that was Adam Pearce. He says he's been the one consistent in the locker room for the last 20 years, so of course he'd make a world title match. But this world title match will be a little bit different. He slowly walks over to the ambulance parked by the stage, and recalls riding in it after getting Claymore kicked three times. As he took that ride, Randy claims it reminded him what he's capable of. He makes some medical puns and says he's going after his 14th world title. Asuka is asked who is the biggest threat to her title reign, Mickey James or Zelina Vega? Before she can answer, she's interrupted by Billy Kay, who says if Asuka is handing out title shots, why not give one to Jen in catering? They're both interrupted by Peyton Royce, who asks why not give her the title shot? Asuka asks if they're even still friends, and they say just because they're not a tag team doesn't mean they can't still support each other. That's exactly what I've been saying. Asuka says no one is ready for her at Clash of Champions, but tonight, she is ready for Peyton Royce. In a number one contenders match, Mickey James takes on Zelina Vega. I believe this is the first singles match on the main roster for Vega, and she has a super aggressive style. For those who don't know, she had a good career in Impact Wrestling prior to coming to WWE. In the end, Zelina reverses the DDT and hits a backstabber for the win. She'll take on Asuka at Clash of Champions. Well, that was a fast rise up the ranks. Cut to backstage where the Hurt Business, now dressed in ring gear instead of suits, are beating up faceless members of RETRIBUTION. MVP says they live for this. There's a quick video of Bianca Belair outdoing her male training partner in the gym at everything from handstands to deadlifts. She is the EST of WWE. Tozawa is at the beach for some reason with a ninja wearing a ref's jersey. 
he screams that they'll wait for R-Truth in the ocean and drags his ninja into the crashing waves. R-Truth comes down with Lil Jimmy and the 24-7 championship to play in the water when suddenly he notices a shark and runs off, dropping his title. Despite the shark, he returns 20 minutes later in search of his baby with a snorkel which Lil Jimmy apparently thinks is used rectally. Truth panics when the shark reappears but manages to rescue his belt, Lil Jimmy, and some torn up clothing he assumes to be Tazawa's. He tells Jimmy that Tazawa got devoured and warns him to never play with sharks. Cedric Alexander is out to take on Apollo Crews. Before the match, MVP clarifies that their match later is a six-man contest. He says, Retribution! May call themselves judge and jury, but around here, the hurt business of the executioners. Cedric says Apollo may think this match is about getting even with him, but it's really about Cedric getting even for being used by Apollo for championship opportunities that he didn't even deserve. Cruz comes out with Ricochet and says tonight is a preview for when he takes back the United States Championship from Bobby Lashley at Clash of Champions. We get the fast, hard-hitting action you'd expect out of these two. There's jawjacking by MVP and Ricochet throughout the match. Towards the end, Cedric gets in Ricochet's face, which distracts him, allowing Apollo to get the surprise roll-up and steal the victory. As Cruz and Ricochet make their way up the ramp, they're distracted by the Hurt Business's music. Before Shelton and Bobby can come out though, MVP and Alexander attack them from behind. They lay out both men, and then Lashley locks in the full Nelson on Apollo. Our first Raw Underground segment of the night is Dolph Ziggler vs. the returning Arturo Ruas. I wish they'd use Ruas more. I always liked him in NXT. It's interesting to see Ziggler's amateur style against Arturo's capoeira style, which looks like dancing. I will say, this is the first time a Raw Underground fight has actually felt like a shoot to me. Dolph wins with a choke. Shane tries to interview Braun, but gets scared and hands the mic over to Brianna Brandy, who I guess is the new Raw Underground interviewer. She asks what we can expect from Strowman tonight. He screams that everyone better have good dental because he's sending them home to their mamas with pockets full of teeth. Then, he invites Shane to fight him, which Shane obviously declines. Seth Rollins makes his way to the ring carrying a large envelope. Something has been bothering him about the Mysterio family. He decided to do some digging when he saw a picture of the family and noticed that Dominic is much taller than Ray. He invites the Mysterios out so he can reveal the truth. They oblige. Ray says they're tired of Seth's mind games, and they're ready to beat him down like they did Murphy. Seth says he's holding the results of a DNA test. He acknowledges that this has been done before, but says times and technology have changed. With a dramatic pause, he reveals that Ray is not the father. Obviously, Ray doesn't believe him. Then it dawns on Seth. His guy only looked into Ray's kid, but didn't specify which one. Perhaps Aaliyah is the illegitimate child. He shows the clip of her consoling Murphy last week and says that's not something a Mysterio would do. Ray says he simply raised a compassionate daughter. Either way, Seth needs to back off. She's only 19. She's naive and knows nothing about their world. Aaliyah takes offense to this comment and storms off with the family not far behind. Seth insincerely apologizes and leaves with a smirk. Lana and Natalia are taking on Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler with the Riot Squad on commentary. Ruby says even though Nia and Shayna are dominant as singles competitors, her and Liv are the real team, which is why they're going to win at Clash of Champions. I think we've heard this before. The match is less than two minutes and ends with Lana tapping out to the Kirafuda clutch. Jackson Baszler bicker before confronting the Riot Squad at ringside, but they escape. So Nia grabs Lana and Samoan drops her through the commentary desk yet again. Drew McIntyre is icing his jaw in the trainer's room. He says he's going to beat the piss out of Randy at Clash of Champions and retain his title. As for tonight, he's going to go pick a fight. The Mysterios are arguing backstage. Aaliyah says she's old enough to speak for herself. She shows off decent acting skills, saying she only came here to support Dominic. Now he's hurt. Ray's hurt. And who knows what Seth has planned for her and her mom. But what does she know? She's just a naive 19-year-old. Ooh, mic drop. Back in Raw Underground, Riddick Moss is taking on Eric of the Viking Raiders. Things are back to looking like a work. Moss wins with a sucker punch. Brianna is back to interview Dabakato this time, but he only wants to speak with Shane. He says tonight Braun will feel what Dabakato is all about. Whatever that means. Next, we get the match between Asuka and Peyton Royce set up earlier in the night. Billy Kay is at ringside. 
Peyton puts up a good fight and even gets a few near falls in before Zelina Vega attacks Asuka, causing the second of three DQs on the night. Vega screams, this is my time now, and runs back up the ramp. Murphy comes across Aaliyah Mysterio backstage. He says everything with Seth has gotten out of hand, and apologizes if he's done anything to hurt her. She seems to accept. Finally, it's the super heavyweight match we've been waiting for, Braun Strowman vs. Daba Kato in Raw Underground. It starts as a fist fight, then spills into the crowd for a bit. Back on the mat, Strowman nails a right cross and starts the ground and pound, which is apparently enough for the ref to call the fight. Shane has an orgasm while Braun poses. I don't think this even lasted three minutes. All that buildup, not only for the match, but for Daba Kato, only for him to effectively get squashed. I've officially given up on this. After all that hype, it wasn't even my favorite Raw segment of the night. My fantasy book to save this would be to incorporate guys with legitimate backgrounds, like King Corbin, who's a Golden Gloves boxer, versus Shinsuke Nakamura, who has five MMA fights under his belt, with three wins. Let them treat it like a shoot, and maybe this could be okay. The team known as Retribution comes out through the audience to dim the lights and no music for their first actual match in WWE against the Hurt Business. Their names are revealed as Slapjack, T-Bar, and Mace. Wow, those are atrocious, and they've rightfully been mocked online. Not only are those names bad, but it feels like a petty response to wrestlers wanting to own their likenesses on social media. Oh, and to answer my question from earlier, MVP is in a suit and not competing. At least, Retribution has an aggressive style, but, um, shouldn't those protective face masks be illegal? Mace and T-Bar do have impressive size and look good together. As for Slapjack, aka Shane Thorne, he's a bumping machine with some good-looking strikes. What's so frustrating is this group could actually work. In the end, Lashley puts Slapjack in the hurt lock and T-Bar punches him. But since he wasn't legal, we get our third DQ of the night. A dozen or more nameless, faceless minions descend upon the ring and start brawling with the Hurt Business, only for Drew McIntyre's music to hit. He rushes out with the rest of the Raw roster. They clear the ring and start to get the upper hand when, in the middle of the melee, Randy Orton hits an RKO on Drew McIntyre out of nowhere. His music plays as the fighting continues around the ring and the watermark displays. Alright, I'm not gonna mince words here. This episode sucked. There's promise bubbling below the surface, but WWE isn't able to execute on any of it. Retribution could be a faction with a point about being misused and overlooked in NXT, but instead they look ridiculous and have a nonsensical message. And that's not even going into those awful names. We could be seeing the emergence of a young, exciting tag team in Dominic and Umberto, but instead we're rehashing the Street Profits vs. Andrade and Angel Garza again. Speaking of rehashing, did we really need to explore Dominic's paternity again? Keith Lee is a megastar in the making, but he lost by DQ for the second time in a row and remains firmly behind older guys like Orton in the pecking order. Finally, I was actually excited about Raw Underground for once, but I guess that will teach me to trust in WWE's booking. The hyped up monster battle was a complete nothing burger, and it can't even build to a feud between these guys. So many missed opportunities, and honestly, it didn't even do a good job of pumping me up for the pay-per-view on Sunday. Even though all the titles are on the line, there's no heat to any of these matches, so I just don't care. Raw continues to be the worst wrestling show currently on TV by a wide margin. Well, that will do it for another episode of Monday Night Raw. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know what you thought in the comments down below. I'll be back tomorrow with my last AEW Dark Reactions from The Garage Pool. I'm taking it down because it's starting to get cold out. And then again on Thursday with an action figure review of AEW Dynamite. There is a special edition of Dynamite on tonight, but I'll only be watching not reviewing that. As always, if you found me and enjoy my content, make sure to do all that normal YouTube stuff. Smash the like button, share with any wrestling or action figure fans you may know, subscribe to the channel, and spread the word. You can also talk to me over on Twitter, at PSUOptimus. Or see all my best figure photography on Instagram at Wrestling Optimus. And if you haven't watched my SmackDown review yet, you can check that out right here. But until next time, I've been Wrestling Optimus, and I'll catch you later.